One, two, three. Welcome to Skelta. My name is Joe Austin. And over the 16 or 17 months that Skelta has been in existence, we have interviewed hundreds of people and we've been listened to and watched by thousands of others. We've entertained the funny, the great, the good and the important. All those interviews were very important to Skelta, but none of them are as important as the interview that we're about to unfold today. My guest is Portugal Murray, the Belfast solicitor. I, I have to say in advance, I, I know that you haven't had a moment to yourself in this last 48 hours, that you've been run from pillar to post. I, I much appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us. I want to thank you on behalf of Skilt, and I want to thank you on behalf of this community, who's, who's very just as you've been defending for so long and so hard. So the Bella Murphy people, the Bella Murphy families, not your clients, but your friends. Tell us about that. How did you first get involved? Well, firstly, Joe, thanks for the opportunity. I'm a big fan of Skelda, so it's an honour to be here. Uh, and the community to talk about, I'm one of that community, and that's obviously my, my passion in this case. My, my own grandmother is from Ballamorphy, my own mother uh, is from Ballamorphy, so uh, this case has been, has been something really special to me, and it's, it's very close to home. Uh, Joan Connolly, who was, who was murdered, on the 9th of August was a friend of my grandmother. My aunts and uncles grew up with uh, the children of some of the victims yeah. as well, so it's quite close to home. So my involvement in this uh, case is, was 12 or 13 years ago, I think some around, sometime around 2008, 2009. When I met the families, at that time the campaign was in its infancy. Um, they were calling for a public inquiry. Uh, in my opinion at that time, that was that was something that might have been unattainable for them. Politically, I didn't see uh, a Secretary, British Secretary of State grant them that because it was in his whim. I advised them at the time that they should consider the route of a new inquest. We had, a, a for the first time in, in 30, 40 years, we had a local Attorney General appointed after the political negotiations in Stormont. And that gentleman was John Larkin QC, yeah. who in my opinion was, was independent, who was fiercely independent. And I thought we had a, we had a decent shout at it. Um, the original inquest were a sham. The soldiers didn't give evidence. The families didn't get any of the relevant disclosure. Uh, they weren't represented properly. So I felt it would be an easy enough job to show that the inquests were inadequate. And we presented that to the Attorney General that he might direct a fresh inquest. So that was the start of my involvement. Uh, sometime around 2010, those applications were made to the Attorney General. It took us a year or two to gather witness statements. And we took statements from hundreds of witnesses over the course of that period. And in 2011, uh, 10 years ago, um, the Attorney General directed inquest into 10 of the deaths. And that brought us to where we are today. Get, get. A lot and a lot of hard work and a lot of sleepless nights and I, and I want to talk about your personal involvement and, and you know the difficulties uh, physical and other ways that you, you face but, but just if this was a film if we were telling a film about 600 combat troops and, and of the paratroop regiment invading a small working class Catholic housing estate and in the aftermath of that we had 10 murders 57 children left with a, a parent gone, we had homes raided and many, many injured. If we were to tell that as a film, nobody would go and watch it. It is so preposterous, it is so obvious that this is unfair, that this shouldn't have happened. But when you talk about taking the case, I mean, what were the difficulties that you had to to get over or to, to, to insulate? Well, there, there are many obstacles. Um and I think I had to come at it with a, a broad lens, broader than probably a lot of lawyers would take at it. Um, I'm a big fan of a sociologist called John Gultang. He was the founder of Peace Studies. And he talks about a triangle of violence. Um, you have the physical violence of the state, which was very obvious here with the course of three days. You had 11 people dead. You had people beaten, people, other people shot who surveyed and, and had to live with the scars of that as well. So the physical violence was very obvious, but I think you couldn't look at this case without looking at the structural violence of the state. And what I mean by that is the discrimination in housing and employment um, that this community had suffered from uh, decades of unionist misrule, sectarian uh, misrule, and then neglect and success of British governments as well. So it happens in a particular context. It didn't happen in the leafy suburbs of Belfast or the Malone Road. And the third part of that triangle is very important, and that, came out, that came to the fore in this inquest. It's what, what, what he called the cultural violence. That was the vilification, demonization of that community, the misinformation that happened after the deaths, you know, the cover-up, 
the gun men, gun women narrative and briefing of the media, you know, and, and General Jackson played a key role in that, he was the Army PRO. So for me, um, I had to look at this in a much broader way uh, than, than probably had been, obviously had been done in the original inquest and I had to look at the context of it. And that, that was always going to be difficult, particularly the, the last part of that, you know, the, 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 the cover up, um, you know, 50 years on getting access to all that doc documentation is going to be difficult. Um, that task was made somewhat easier by the inquest process where there, there are obligations on the parties to provide disclosure initially to the coroner and then the, the coroner discloses material which is potentially relevant to the inquest. So we did get access to more information. And what we were able to show is that um, the original coroner um, wasn't cited of all the evidence. And a good example was Eddie Doherty where a soldier made Two different statements. The initial statement to the Royal Military Police, he talked about emptying his clip. The second statement, he fired one William shot, which is obviously consistent or more consistent with the yeah. yellow card rules. It's a better story. It was a manufactured statement and it, and it was the second. So that the, the other statement wasn't provided to the coroner, the second statement was. So as we get further disclosure, those obstacles started to fall away. We started to understand more uh, about what happened at that particular time. But that didn't mean there weren't there weren't difficult days. Um, even you know even even in terms of preparing the case, there's a concept in law of equality of arms that once you're in the courtroom, all the parties get a fair crack to present yeah. their case. Yeah. But even before you get there, we had difficulties in preparation, whether it was getting access to documents, but even funding, representation. The MOD is a massive organisation with deep pockets, and they can hire whatever lawyers they want. I had great difficulty getting a team of lawyers, a team of counsel in place, obstacles with legal aid, uh, going through the hoops of that. And even when we get it, there's an entirely different uh, scale for, for lawyers being, being paid. They were paid on a monthly basis. And for the first 10 years of this case, we, we had no facility to be paid. And it's only in the last year or two that uh, an interim payment scheme was put in place that allowed one payment per year. So for me, in a, a small office, it was even the difficulty of keeping everything going you know, paying your staff, yeah. keeping that going, even before you get into that courtroom. So, I mean, there, there isn't, you know, we weren't as prepared or have the same um, facilities as the MOD might have had, but what we did have, which they didn't have, was commitment. And people who were prepared to do pro bono work, and I include, you know, the, the, our own office, the, the, all the council involved. And, and I mean, one, one great example of that is Michael Mansfield, QC, yeah. one of the of course, most yeah. well-known QCs in the world. Very few people know that he flew over here, stayed in the Europa for months on end. That wasn't covered by legal aid. He paid for that himself. He came even before the inquest started. He had meetings with families, strategy meetings with me. None of that was paid by legal aid. So I'm not sure if uh, Michael, you know, um, made very much money out of the, the mm -hmm. following movement, Des despite years and despite hundreds and thousands of hours of commitment to that. But it shows he was a different type of lawyer uh, with, with the commitment uh, to follow this case through and he done it, he done it very well. So all those obstacles, or things that people don't see before we even step into the first day of that inquest. That's the very purpose of this, this discussion because I, I think that we all owe you a debt of gratitude and all the others who, who you, you've mentioned and who worked with it. And again, just to kind of give a sense of it, we had the murders, of course, and all the things that were surrounding that. We had a media who acquiesced and either, either covered up or turned a blind eye. We had a judicial system who thought it was their responsibility to, de to defend the British military. And then we had, a, with no disrespect, we had a small firm based in West Belfast trying to surmount all of these odds. I mean, there must have been times when, when you felt like beating your head off a brick wall. It must have been so frustrating for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, there were, there were days when you wondered, even before the Attorney General made his decision, there were sleepless nights where you worried that you were doing the wrong thing for them that you were taking them down a legal route. And remember, in this community, which I grew up in, um, many people didn't trust the criminal justice processes, yeah. and for good reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, my, my own grandmother always, always said to me, and one of the reasons I done law was that you can use the law as a tool, as a, an instrument to help your community, but, but a lot of people didn't agree with that. A lot of people thought, well, you know, you have a very unionist judiciary, you have a compliant uh, prosecution, you have uh, obviously an, an RUC who weren't investigating these matters properly. The military weren't been held to account. There was impunity. So you had like a, a, a justice system there that was being used to deny human rights abuses rather than make those accountable for those abuses. 
So it was very, it was very, you know, I had to persuade families that this might work, that things had changed, that the, um, you know, those camp, th those legal campaigns by families such as, you know, the Gibraltar case yeah. is one I know yeah. you're familiar with, yeah. who took cases to court, you know, the McCann case and, and Dan McCann's a relative of mine, um, who took cases to the European court, who suddenly, um, you know, the inquest system looked very different than what it did in 1972. There were possibilities. And then a key, a key moment was the implementation of the European Convention on Human Rights. That was a game changer because it meant the state had certain obligations that they didn't have before around disclosure, around the transparency, around involvement of the next of kin in the proceedings. And that was very, very important. So that job of persuading them wasn't an easy one, it was a difficult one. And I have to say, I had my own doubts. I had my own doubts that I was doing the right thing. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it was, it, it was, I didn't think we had any alternative as a lawyer. I, the piecemeal mechanisms that we have for dealing with the past are very, very imperfect. We just got to use them, stretch them, um, you know, uh, do what we can for families. And I felt that the inquest route was our, was our best shoot, but, but by no means a guarantee. It was by no means uh, inevitable that we would get to this point. You probably haven't had time to catch your breath, let alone to watch television footage yeah. and all of that. And I want to ask you about that relationship that you developed with the families, um, because it was very much a partnership of, of, of moving forward. For anybody who has seen it, there is, a, there is a wonderful chat, it's a great chat, and it's of the families gathered outside when they, they come out to kind of announce to the world, this is where we are, this is what we've got, and you're behind it. And I'm looking at your face and it's a mixture of tears, I have to say, uh, and emotion rather than tears is a better word. And that kind of thought, I've got it. Was it was that a draining, a telling moment for you? It was. It was. It was highly emotional. What 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 obviously people didn't see was within the hall, and as the, I mean, it was two and a half hours. I know some people were watching it on the site link, in their homes or in, in various community yeah. uh, centres. Um, it was highly highly emotional within the room, and and when the coroner stood up to leave the room. Uh, I mean, it was a great, it was a great relief. Personally, uh, we had come on a long, long journey. I, I'm obviously only part of that journey. The families were on a much longer journey than me, um, so it was very emotional. Um, and my relationship with the families, I mean, my office was like a drop-in centre. It wasn't the formal solicitor's office, and, and deliberately so. We held meetings there on a weekly basis, sometimes more whenever, whenever we needed to. Um, whenever any of the families called into my office, they walked straight into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. There's no formalities, and they yeah. stuck a, stick the kettle on, yeah. and I think it's somewhere that they felt very comfortable with. It wasn't it wasn't the, the, the normal client relationship, you know, that you have. In fact, you know, I'm from Ballymurphy. They knew my family. Um, you know, Rita, fam Rita Banner, uh, brother of John, La or sister of John Lavery, would refer to me as her big son. Yeah. And so when I meet them in the street, where there'd be hugs and kisses and. So that was a very, very different relationship, and it's one that I was very comfortable with because I'm, I'm from that community. It's, yeah. they're, they're my people, and um, when I first decided that I wanted to embark on a legal career, th those are the people I want to represent. I'm much more comfortable in their company than I am with most other lawyers. I mean, I don't, I don't get involved in too much um, events for other lawyers or socialising. I'm much more comfortable with those clients and the other clients that I represent throughout the, all of the other legacy cases. So, yeah, that came very natural, I have to say. I want to talk about that natural kind of relationship, but I want to talk about it in general. And although we're going to concentrate on Ballymurphy and all of those those things, because it is in the now, and there are many other human rights cases that you're involved yeah. in, and they all have their own unique difficulties, and they all have the cards stacked against against the the families. Did you know at an early age that you wanted to be a lawyer, or, or what clicked into your head, or what motivated you? I had no choice in it, is the truth. Uh, my tell, grandmother, Molly Tell me Mo what that means. Molly Murray, uh, my grandmother, um, at, at that particular time growing up, my father was a political prisoner. Uh, a number of my uncles were as well. So there were very few meals around, around the house. And uh, my grandmother, obviously, and, and, uh, would have had often had visits to the prisons, going up and down to the prisons. Um, so she would have had interaction with lawyers. And growing up, she always spoke very warmly about Pat Finnegan and PJ McGrory and Oliver Kelly, people like that, lawyers who at that time, it was very difficult representing their clients. And, and we know the consequences for some of those lawyers, you yeah, know, like Pat, Pat and Rosemary, yeah, and yeah, I knew Rosemary yeah. uh, myself, uh, Nelson myself, that's, that's another story we'll talk about. Um, so, but she always talked with great 
um, respect about them. And it was the small things. It wasn't their oratory skills in the court. It was the fact that on one occasion, I remember it very, very well, that one of my uncles were, were, were in court in Lisbon and she had gone along with, with her daughter. And Pat Finucane said, right, how are you getting home? And in those days, it wasn't easy to get from Lisbon yeah. to Clannard. Yeah. And Pat Finucane says, get in the back of the car, I'm driving you home. And he drove them home. And that's the stories he told me about lawyers. So lawyer, lawyers were honourable. And a term she always used, you can do good for your community by being a lawyer. She had seen the consequences for her son and sons-in-laws uh, through uh, their activism in other ways. Um, and she wanted something very different for the next generation. And that was I, my earliest memory, that's around seven years of age. And from then I said, I want to be a lawyer. Before I really knew what it meant, I always wanted to be a lawyer. And she spoke about, in particular, about a Michael Mansfield. And, and I remember, a, I think it was a, a broadsheet, it might have been a Sunday Times article, that talked about this lawyer uh, who, whose, whose parents were, were, were Tories. Uh, in fact, he had actually electioneered for Margaret Thatcher. They were in the yeah. Margaret Thatcher's constituency. And there was this article about this lawyer and how he was now a social justice uh, lawyer. And she talked about Michael Mansfield and, and so on and so forth. So lawyers were always a very positive, positive things were being said about lawyers when I was growing up in my grandmother's house. And I thought, yeah, that's something I'd like to do. And if I can help my own community uh, by doing that, then even better. And I always said that someday, um, someday I'll bring Michael Mansfield here. And I'll introduce him to my grandmother, and eventually we done that. So oh, I met him with you as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember, I remember him coming, and he, I remember the first time he asked him to get involved in Ballymorphy, and obviously I felt that once we got the inquest, um, I thought this is my opportunity to work with Michael Mansfield. He won't turn this down. He had worked on Bloody Sunday, he'd worked with Stephen Lawrence. I mean, he's involved in the grand film inquiry at the minute, ongoing. Um, you know, an absolutely tremendous lawyer, a radical lawyer. Um, and I remember the call that I made to him, they asked him, I was playing in a football game and we had organised early in the week through email, they would phone him at say five o'clock on a Sunday and the game was f close to five finished. And I remember as soon as the whistle went, it was a final, we lost the final, there's no time to feel sorry for myself. I run into the changing room, got changed, went out into the car park and phoned him and I says, yes, hello, hi, and it's the first time we talk, and talk directly. And I said, I'd like you to do a particular case for me. It's the Ballon Murphy says, I know all about it. I heard about it. Yeah. The answer is yes. And he says, well, there's one condition. And there was a silence. And I think Michael said, who's this upstart here? He's going to put me. conditions on me. Yeah. And there was a silence. And I said, when you come to Belfast, you must go to Clannard and meet my grandmother. That's the condition or you don't get the case. So the first time that he came for a preliminary hearing, um, I had to pick him up at the airport and brought him back. So we're going back to the airport. And I says, now, Michael, you have to fulfill your promise. And he'd forgotten about it. I says, well, what do you mean? I says, well, you have to come, no problem. So I phoned Molly, I says, get the kettle on, I have a visitor, and I'll be there in five minutes. And Michael came in, and the two of them sat. And, and I have a great photo of this. And what, what struck me about Michael, and this is why he's different, he sat on the settee holding Molly's hand and talked about old cases, because she used to love the old trials and you know, the yeah, insane yeah, story. Yeah. And he talked about a few of his old cases, but the whole time he held her hand. And I thought, that's why he's different. That's, he may have a very different background from me, but that's why he's a good lawyer. He, he, he comes to that community, he gets to know that community, he's comfortable with that community, and there's a human level uh, which makes him you know, very, very different. And that's, thankfully for me, I was able to come full circle, where I was able to get involved in cases like this. But not only that, bring Michael Mansfield to Clannard and sit in the living room of Molly Murray and have a cup of tea. I have to say I, I have known you since a child. Yeah. And, and I've known you professionally since you became a, a lawyer and you are exceptional and you're exceptional because you're one of that small band, unfortunately a small band of lawyers who when they're addressed as human rights lawyers actually are human rights lawyers and, and, and maybe it's a, maybe a wee bit misleading that we talk about all these cases as they affect the nationalist community but I have to put on record that you will, you will argue any case for anyone who deserves some a champion in their corner, and, and I want to just go back to that term. But but can I just say that along that journey you, you speak about uh, and that aspirational and the, and the, the real reasons why lawyers are important people. There must have been the downside. There must have been the other people who are career. I don't mean I don't want you to name anybody, but there must be the people who are careerists, and for for them the law and the sanctity of the law is a job. Yeah. And does that, does that 
does that annoy you? Does it upset you? Does it surprise you? Is it okay? Is that the way the world is? Well, it is what it is, is, is what I'd say about that. Um, I have had situations in the courtroom. And, you know, when I, I had issued writs on the 40th anniversary of internment, for example, yeah. in relation to the legality of all of that. And I remember in the, the Belfast Magistrate Court in the queue to mention the case, and the lawyer uh, behind me uh, tapping the shoulder says, uh, what about your 40 year writs? You know, there's a statute, there's a limitation on issuing writs. Yeah. We were arguing that that should be set aside, new evidence was coming to light and so on. But that, that, was, that was a pretty novel approach then. It was been done by the lawyers in England in relation to the, the Mau Mau in, in Kenya. Yeah. So we, we, were, we were getting a wee bit of inspiration from all of that and trying it here in, in a similar type case. But that was a sort of commentary. Sort of, I, I was only open, I was pretty, still pretty young in the profession, but there was that sort of matter. You know, oh, your 40 year writs, as though I didn't understand the law. And um, you know, and, and I was told that well, you're mad opening an office and doing legacy cases because you're not going to get paid for 10, 15, 20 years. You have to pay the bills, and that's silly, and that'll never work. And my argument that was, well, I'm not a businessman, and I don't want to be a businessman. Um, I appreciate my model isn't a great business model, but you know that wasn't what it was about for me. And there were many days. There were many days where you know financially you struggled. I mean, I remember my wife's the office manager. There were months when we uh, couldn't pay ourselves. There was, you know, I remember one particular Christmas. Um, my wife was in tears. Where, you know, you know, how are we doing this? We can't do it. You know, and you know, my staff were always paid, but there's occasions and staff probably don't know this, where we weren't for yeah. sometimes for months, uh, particularly in the early days. So you had that, you had that sort of uh, mapping of you, and I don't know what was said behind your back. I'm sure yeah. there's a wee bit yeah, of that yeah. as well. You also had the, the sort of personal difficulties, but I have to say that. At no point did I consider anything else. It was a passion for me. It wasn't something that was, you know, how can I make myself comfortable here? Um, it was it was an absolutely deep passion, and with that comes sacrifices, and those sacrifices are, are just part of it. So you know, you just had to get through all of that. And thankfully, I mean, it always worked out. And I have a, a view of this: if you, if you do good things, it comes back to you. You know, it comes back around to you. And I remember buying my first office, and. Um, an, an old fellow walked into the office who I didn't know, and he, he says, can, can, I, can I see you? And I brought him up to the office, I thought it was going to be another legal case. And he says, can you look out the window and look across the road? Because I had started in a rental property in a Springfield with a very, very small office, basically one room, uh, with a partition down the middle. Oh, and, he I says, it, yeah. and he said, look across the road, of a building across the road, I'm a doctor, I'm retired, do you want a bad? He says, I'd admire your work in Ballamorphy, and he specifically mentioned Ballamorphy, um, and I want to offer to you first. And for me, that was a moment where the good stuff you do comes around and you get a benefit somewhere else because somebody, somebody seen the, the work you were doing in that particular case and I got a break. And at that particular time, I always wanted an office on the Springfield Road. I mean, it's only a few doors from my mother's That's house right. and my father's house. Um, and there you go. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was you know, someone there who had been following your work. In other circumstances, that opportunity would have opened. So for me, even though you have those difficult days, you get to meet a lot of good people you get the breaks elsewhere, you get to meet the greatest clients. So really for me, it isn't really a big deal. That's, that's just the sacrifices you make, but you get much more back. There's no question about that. I, I want to ask you two questions to take you down a lane you don't normally go down. So I'm giving you a warning that these are not the questions that you, that you normally uh, are asked. And one is, you, you talk about sleepless nights and you talk about the, the, the constant need to check everything twice to be better, not better once than, than the opposition, but better twice, three times and four times than the opposition. What effect does that have on your family? What effect does that have on, mm. on t even time with your, with your kids and your wife? Uh, yes, I mean, preparation, the devil's in the detail, and the way I approach these cases is that you must engross yourself in it. There's no, there's no, there's no other way, so that takes a lot of time, and given the volume of papers, the volume of work, you have to meet with the families regular. You have to. I mean, there's most of your evenings are, are, are out meeting people and doing work because you know some sometimes that can happen during the day, um, and it does it does take its toll. I mean, I'm very lucky that um, I have a very understanding wife and very understanding family. I mean, my family support what I do, um, and they're very proud of you. I'm, I'm sure. sure I hope, hope they are. Oh, hope they, they are. are. Okay. Um, but uh, and, and I have children, and my son now is is has got his law degree. Uh, it's now working in the office. My daughter's finishing her law degree soon, so some of it has rubbed off. But 
I mean, I suppose a couple of years ago when my son was, was thinking about law, he wasn't sure. And by the way, I wasn't too fussy. I mean, I, I, I didn't care what to do. I wasn't pushing him in that direction. And in fact, I probably told him some of the downsides, mm -hmm. but I really didn't need to. And what struck me one time about my son, I thought it was a very wise comment from me on, on young shoulders. Before he was contemplating law and, and other options, he'd, he'd, he'd come to me and he'd chatted and he said, listen, I don't think I want to do law. I just I see what you do and it's too many hours and I just don't want to live that life. I thought that's a great answer. The, the other answer of, I just want to be what you are, without really knowing what it was, was, would have been naive. But I thought it was very ways of them to say that. And it struck me that it was, they could see it. I just, I mean, I was doing my thing and it was normal for me. I'd been coming in late and, and all of that. And they never complained, so it never really, but he was clocking it. And yeah, he was he, saying, yeah, Jesus, this isn't, this. Now, f you know, for some reason, um, hopefully, you know, being inspired by some of the work he's able to do in the office with me. He's now come round to the idea, and he's back working in the office. But he contemplated for a long time, and the main the main reason that he that he, that he thought against it wasn't the type of cases per se, but that sort of lifestyle. He's seen the impact it obviously had on on on, on my personal life, and my family's personal life. So uh, uh, there's no doubt it takes its toll. But as I say, the the rewards far far outweigh that. There's no question. You mentioned people who inspire you, Rosemary Nelson. Pat Fanook and PJ McCrory, Oliver Kelly, all of those people. And I asked you, I asked you very pointedly how you were seen by the, the bulk of those involved in the legal profession who who keep their keep their hands in their pockets and their noses clean, if you just excuse that expression. And you know and I know that the that, that sections of the media made it very easy to vilify those people who have died. Uh, uh, does it frustrate you when you see a media that, that either through laziness or because they've acquiesced that they, 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 they don't highlight the cases that need to be highlighted, they, they can qualify them. And let me give you an example of that. Yesterday morning there was a, an interview, this is 24 hours after the, the, the verdict in the coroner's court, there was an interview on a, on a main radio station and they referred to the so-called Balmer Free Massacre, so-called. After the now, you could you could say that may have been justified, and I doubt it. Before the the coroner's decision, but after, it, I mean, so called. Does does that frustrate you? Does it make your job more difficult? Does it make you more determined? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the media. I've had some good relationships with media over the years because um, I mean, back in the day, it was it was even worse, and then there's other times it's been very frustrating. I mean, the right wing media. Um, have carried this ex fat stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Our poor soldiers, human rights lawyers harassing and haranguing. There was a Daily Mail article which talked about uh, my father. Yes, uh, John Murray, who's a prominent Republican. Yeah, and uh, and a proud prominent Republican. Yeah, so there's no secret of that. No secret at all. But and and the <coughs> fact that we were making millions, um, you know, off these cases, and, and other lawyers as well, not just myself. We were doing that with with some other legal offices as well, and. Um, you know that 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 media stuff is is pretty dangerous because it isn't just the articles. I mean, in the city centre, occasionally people would shout at you. What about you? Yeah, you're making millions off this and blah blah blah, and certain commentary as well. So the the, the media, particularly the right wing media, probably more across the water, but also here there's been a reluctance. And I I mean it's only days like, you know, we had the other day that will probably over time change that. Um, you know. During the whole inquest, I think this is significant, during the whole inquest, which went on for over a year, a hundred days of evidence, our, uh, 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 the Irish media turned up once, an Irish Times journalist. It was a day that Jerry Adams was given evidence, and the story was, Jerry Adams is going to get grilled here. And I remember I got into the lift after, because, you know, that really annoyed me. I remember getting in the lift with the journalist, and I bit my tongue, and I felt like saying to him, there are 10 people that died here. Yeah. And there's been many other days here where witnesses have come along and described in vivid detail how these people were massacred. And you didn't feel like you'd get in the car and drive up here and cover that. But you want to come here and you want to get a, yeah. a headline yeah. and a story. Yeah. So even, even during the inquest, um, <clears throat> there were one exception, Will Leeds from the BBC was there every day. He was an exception, done a great job and done it in a very sensitive way. Um, but aside from that, there weren't too many and they had their own interest and that particular case the interest was in the families that wasn't the story 
uh, and I put my lip going down the lift and uh, I don't know if I'm glad I did or not. But over the last few days, I've been inundated with, you know, interview requests from RTE. So you got to think that that's maybe yeah. a positive because not very many people <coughs> in the South understand what happened. And if this, uh, if this, these findings and the, the events of the last few days change that, then that's, that's good. Will we always have a battle around the narrative? Of course, there's no question about that. But I do feel that legal judgments, and I think this is why the legal process is important, legal judgments, legal findings, make that much easier for the media to comment on it more accurately. Um, so hopefully we're moving in a better direction, but there have been difficulties. There's no question with the reporting of these events. And I think I said when we began this interview, and I want to just repeat it for the record, and this is the first sit down, prolonged conversation that you've had with anyone around the, the inquest results. The longest inquest, I, I think. Longest in history in the North, yeah. And, and I appreciate that very much. And I know you're getting dragged from pillar to post, and I know you're, 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 you're exhausted, I have to say that as well. But the story has to be told. It yeah. has to get out there. Can I ask you this, and, and, and I don't know why you, there is an answer to it, or maybe there isn't. You know, and I said again at the beginning that you were, that, that the Bella Murphy family weren't clients or were friends. Yeah. And friends go through trauma and they go up and down in their relationship. And, they, and I mean, is there an exercise when everybody can, I, I don't mean physically group hugs, but everybody's doubts are, are, are gotten over by everyone, that it's, it's this, we're all in this together. Was there that kind of mentality? Abs abs absolutely no doubt. There's a collective thing. Um, and one of the worries actually getting into the inquest was because there, there, there are five different incidents in Balmurphy over the course of those three days. And even as a lawyer, evidentially they were all different. Some of them were stronger than others. I had a real great worry that some of them would get over the lane, if you were, and that was easier. You know, um, Father Mullen's case was, I mean, it was clear. Yeah. It was pretty clear. And, Joan Conley, a mother of eight, um, you know, this, this so-called gun woman who's out in her skirt um, uh, looking for her daughter. I mean, I, f I felt that, you know, that case there would, would, would be very difficult for the MOD. There were others, and it wasn't because of any concern about what the deceased were doing. It was just the lack of evidence, and particularly John Lavery and Joseph Core, when the soldiers came over the mountain on the 11th morning, 4 a.m., it was dark. When, when the police started, or the soldiers started firing, people ran. So you didn't have what you had in the Mance or Springfield Park on the 9th of August, where there were many people gathering and mm. witnesses. Yeah. Um, we hadn't great witnesses. So there, there was a concern, and I, I felt this even from the families. I mean, they, 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 they got this as well, that as, as, as we were getting, building an evidence base in some of the other cases, it, it just wasn't as easy. And that's, and that's something that really worried me. But in times like that, you could see their worry, their stress, uh, you know, how it was going to go, the other families, would have, would have been very kind to them. We would have been supportive. You know, we, we had those moments where we had doubts. And, and in fact, you know, it was a great relief to me that during the inquest, those, those particular two deaths went really, really well at the inquest. And, and the reason for that, there were a couple of army statements which came late in the day. Some of these soldiers were, were traced. And one of them struck me very well. And the judge actually commented on it in her, in her judgment. It obviously stuck in her mind that when these two uh, when, when, when John and Joe were laid on the ground and, and the first soldiers then they appear, which is an immediate aftermath of the yeah. shooting, some of the soldiers walked past them. They clearly they didn't feel any threat was there. They weren't looking for a gun. No. And then one of the soldiers commented, and, it's, and it was, I don't know whether he meant that it's significant or not, but it was highly significant, where he said, I passed one of the, one of the, one of the males on the ground and he was wearing work clothes. He did not look like a terrorist. That was in the statement. And that case for me started to change. And it was it was comments that they may seem small. No, they're, they're obviously but, but they're very very important. Significant, yeah. Uh, when soldiers soldier be in that particular case, who's never traced, and I have doubts whether whether that statement was actually from a soldier. I think it was a, a falsified statement. He isn't traced. Um, you start to have difficulties when there aren't many witnesses to the actual shooting. You have difficulties, but we events like that started to turn, and it started to create a picture. And then the Doyle brothers who were beaten just down the street, give mm -hmm. absolute, you know, they give harrowing testimony of that. The picture started to emerge, that puzzle started to be put together. And it was our great relief and, and cases, you know, those two cases went really well at inquest and then obviously the judge gave her findings in those as well. So there were moments, this wasn't everybody is gonna be great here. This is all gonna work out well. 
Some of these cases were, were difficult even from a lawyer's perspective, and families knew it. But we rallied, we got together, there were tears, there were hugs. And, you know, we always said, no matter what happens, we're in this together. If we get good news for some, bad news for others, we're, still we're all there, no matter what. I know you can't comment in any great detail, because this is a moving picture. Um, last night, the Wednesday night, there was the controversy about the phone call, the apology and all of that. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on that per se. What I will ask you to comment about, the world, uh, and even the hostile media, <coughs> has been reluctant or forced or, or left no opportunity to do other ways, have reported the facts around the murders and the details that led up to those facts. Have the British government learned anything? Does it, is it, does it feature in their heads? Uh, this Tory government, no. I think what they, and they've shown it with the, this proposal around an amnesty, is that they're more concerned with the ex-VAT community and the right-wing media than they are with people in Ballymurphy. That very belated and cack-handed effort by Boris Johnson, and we're seeing some of the developments that today around an apology, has been forced. Has been a result of the reaction to the findings and not out of any generosity of spirit or generosity of heart from Boris Johnson. My honest opinion is he doesn't care. And I don't think he cares for working class communities in England either. Never mind Ballymurphy, the Falls Road, the Shankill Road. So the answer is no. Um, what, what I would say though is that when we have legal findings, I think that can make a difference. Because I have no doubt if the military were to be deployed today somewhere else, even in this, and I think this is the, the, some of the, the, the biggest outworkings of, of things like Bloody Sunday and Bala Murphy in Quest Finance, is that the military plan and military operation today have to think, well, in 30, 40 years, I may be held accountable for this. Yeah. So therefore, we got to work out how we do this. The rules have changed. The old rules don't apply anymore. And our soldiers will get a rap on the door. They'll be called in inquest. They'll be called in inquiry. So we've got to think about this differently. So I do think it has repercussions. Maybe not then necessarily the today with Boris Johnson. It's not going to change his political outlook in the world. But I do think it has ramifications. It's that small wave. And if you have a lot of those waves, the old Bobby Kennedy quote, that can make a big difference. And I think this is one of those moments where the military and the MOD are going to have to step back and say, how do we do this? You know, the cover up, we didn't get away with it. Everything we've done 40, 50 years ago, we didn't get away with it. So we have to think about this differently. The European Convention on Human Rights is obviously, they're held to a higher standard. And you can see now this Tory government, one of its manifesto pledges is to get rid of that. You can see why. Yeah, it course. holds you to account. So these, these legal victories, and in various cases like McCarr and stuff in Europe and McCann case in Europe, I mean, the, the European courts is dominated with Irish cases, Northern Irish cases, and, and these findings as well. There'll be people reading these findings further afield and looking at them and saying, right, how can we use this? And that includes the military, in my opinion, we'll have to think about this. So it does have an impact, there's no question. We're, we're coming to the end of your interview, you'll yeah. be glad to hear. As in, uh, you haven't too bad, Joe. Uh, well, no, I, I know you're tired <laughs> and know all of that there. And, and, and I want to make an observation. A young lawyer who wins a case like this case retires on it. There's nothing, you know, your skills, your ability, your concern, your current. It's there, it's up to, to be seen. You've done it. You have other cases that are around the corner that are coming down this track that are equally as difficult and hard. So maybe do you want to kind of tell us where you're working at yeah. and what you're working on? I mean, my next case is in August. It's a 10 year old Stephen Gaddis who was shot dead by the army using a plastic bullet on the Falls Road. That starts in August for four or five weeks. That's going to be another. And it's actually one of those cases that I you know, get very emotionally involved with. It's a, it's a, a young child, obviously. And I remember the meeting with the mother and father, the first meeting I had, they came into my office and I met with them and they told me about the original inquest. And at this stage, they hadn't gotten it. They were looking for a new inquest. And they told me what the judge said to him. I mean, this, this young child was just back from America. He was with, with Project Children. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a sunny night, a summer's night, um, and usually he had to be in for nine o'clock. And the father had gone 
to the mother and says, right, it's, it's real about Nanny, I'm going to have to bring him in here. And the mother said, sure, you know, when do you get an egg like that? Mm -hmm. Let him stay for another wee bit. And tragically, this child was then shot just shortly after that. And the father went to the inquest, and I think it was the following year, and the coroner at that particular time, the father stood up and said, you know, I want to know what happened to the son, something along those lines. He yeah. told, me this, told me this in my office. And the judge said to him, your son should not have been out after nine o'clock. And I could see the weight on that father's shoulders. Yeah, of course. When he came to my office, and at that time it was, you know, just over 30 years later, 40 years later, that was still on him. And in all my time, doing these cases, that's the angriest I've ever been. When a, when a parent of a child, an innocent child, and this child was holding a lollipop stick when he was shot, was no threat. And at that time, my son was 10. It, it, it really struck yeah, me. Yeah. And holding, and I, I just thought, it made me really angry, and I thought, this is why I do this job. Because judges like that should not be tolerated. Who make commentary like that, who treat people like that, and they talk about their courts. It's not their courts. They're our courts. They adjudicate in those courts, and they should do so with sensitivity to families. And that case made me angry. It was the only time that I said, I promise you an inquest. I'll get this inquest. And as soon as the meeting finished, they went, I probably shouldn't have done that because I can't be sure. <laughs> but I was so angry that I thought, yeah, this case here. So it's another, another example of um, how this community was treated, not only by the soldiers, that was a perfect example of how the legal system treated that father who lost his 10-year-old child. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to do law, was to change that. But that was not going to be acceptable anymore. And what we have, thankfully now, are judicial figures. And Justice Keegan, I have to say, dealt with these families in a, in a very, very sensitive way. They were front and centre um, for you know, many different ways. Um, but that, that case there for me was one that was... That, um, confirm for me why I wanted to do this. So that we, we eventually got the inquest open and that case begins in August for four, four or five weeks. So there's the, the, the case with Spring Hill Massacre, which was, yeah. um, you know, Father Fitzpatrick, another local priest was killed in the same community as Balamorphy. And children were also killed during that incident. So that was May 72, with the Kelly's Bar explosion where the army tried to blame Republicans. Uh, an own goal. We have, now, bomb, yeah. we, have yeah. now, we have now shown that to be yeah. untrue and that the army observed as loyalists planted the bomb. So that's another. And there, there are many more. MRF, the military action force, who were undercover soldiers involved in murders to try and stoke sectarian um, fear in, in this community. And there are also many other inquests which aren't related to the legacy. I'm currently involved in one with the, the first PSNI killing a, a young man, Neil McConville. Um, so that, and their medical negligence. So there are many other cases where we've used the skills that we have in those legacy cases. We've used them in non-legacy cases with the same same type of skills. And and there's some inquests where, where I represent. You mentioned earlier on representing people from outside the community yeah, with some course, of those yeah. as well. So there's plenty to be doing, Joe. There's no time to rest. We'll get this one and then we'll move on. There's there's other work to be done. That kind of brings me to my two last 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 questions because I've said last three times. <laughs> You mentioned, or I mentioned perhaps, the small bond, relatively small bond of lawyers who, yeah. who take on these cases, fight these cases, occasionally win them, sometimes lose them, but fight them. And that's the, yeah. the, the, the thing. Is it getting bigger? Is that small group getting bigger? I think so. I think, I think. Um, I mean, I was inspired by um, the Rosemary Nelson's, Pat Finucane's This World. Um, I was fortunate to have met Rosemary shortly before she died. Um, and it was, she had asked me to come and work with her. Um, unfortunately, that never happened because that's it, certainly a route I probably would have took. Um, and I have to say, I mean, it's very important. The, the, the human person is very important in all of this. You can't have justice with good laws alone. You can have the European Convention on Human Rights. You can't have justice with good institutions. So the beautiful High Court we have and the Lagansay Complex and the facilities, that's, that's not justice. That's just a building. Yeah. And that law is just a bit of paper. Yeah. And it's a wee bit like having Joe Austin give me a good recipe here for a meal, and I don't have the chef skills, to make it. Uh, or I don't have the um, items that you need to make that meal, or I can't afford them, you know, legal aid, similar. Equally, in the legal profession, justice comes through the human use of the instrument. 
So it's very important that we have people who want to do these cases because you're not going to make as much money as a corporate lawyer. So if you want to make money, it's about money. Go and do corporate law. Go for it. Else. And fair play to you. That's, that's your choice. If you, if, you want, if you want to do pro bono work, you want to do in a very different way, you want to face obstacles, you want to, you, you want to make less, then put your passion, then this is the way to do it. So it's very important. People think justice is a set of laws. It's not. It's the people who bring their commitment, their passion to it. And that was very important for me in choosing my legal team as well. I had to, t I had to pick people who not only were bright, who understood the law, who were expertise in the law, we had a deep, deep passion for what we were doing and also could communicate with those families. And, 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 and that's the type of people. Are there more people doing it? I think so. I think there's a lot of young people now. I get regular emails from people, young people who are very interested in this type of work, who want to come along and do some work experience, who want to, who want to come and work in our office. And I've seen that increasing. And I think in later this Bala Murphy fame, I think there'll be young people out there who'll be reading that, hopefully within our own community. You're saying, I now understand that that, that, that that sounds like a good job. I'd like to do that. Because even if we deal with all the legacy, even in a different political situation in the future, there'll always be bad policing. Yeah. It's everywhere in the world. Yeah. The state will always mess up somewhere. It doesn't matter who's in charge or under what constitutional arrangement. There will always be human rights abuses. There will always be, med there will always be medical negligence cases with, with a human rights element to it. So there, there will always be human rights work. The state and we're, we're an accountability mechanism for that, and that will always exist. So young people coming through, I would absolutely encourage them. Will you have difficulties? Yeah. Will you earn less than the corporate lawyer? Yeah. But will you get satisfaction? Absolutely, 100%. It's, 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 it's not quantifiable. I, I know as we speak, you're waiting on statements, important statements, and the, the, uh, there's advice to be given, as always. Yeah, I've got my first first email from Boris Johnson, so that's a well, woke up there this morning. He'll get the email me, but if he does, I, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, will you get time off? Will you, will you relax? What will, we, what will the next couple of days, apart from today, what will they bring for you? Uh, I, I'm in the middle of another inquest, um, and a couple of my staff, thankfully, the last couple of days have been um, assist me with that. And there are many other things to do. And aside from being a lawyer, I'm also a, a GAA football manager, mm. and the season, believe it or not, starts on Sunday. <laughs> so five, six nights a week. Um, this week's been a wee bit of an exception. I'm on the football field. I manage an under-15 team and then a senior football mm. team. So I'd, I'd actually talk to wife about this, because we get a day or two away, and going, well, how can I? We have a match here, we're training them, with this and that. And then we're taxi drivers for the kids, who are also playing all their various sports. So. A break, I'm not sure, and that's obviously been made more, made more difficult with the current COVID regulations and restrictions as well. Um, probably not soon, but definitely, hopefully, um, I'll be able to take a wee bit of time off and uh, reflect on this a wee bit more because it's a bit, it's just been a, a, a whirlwind at the minute. But um, yeah, that'll come eventually, but I don't know when. We both agree that, that the Bella Murphy families are special. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not unique. Yeah. And we began this interview by me. Uh, trying to thank you, not on behalf of Skelter, which is which I do, of course, but we all could be, or any of us could be, Bala Murphy families, or or North Belfast families, or anybody else. We are fortunate to have a champion in you. We are fortunate that you did stand up. We are fortunate that you did fight. So, on behalf of all of those, and not just Skelter, I want to thank you for your time. You could have been sleeping rather than get getting interrogated by me. So for all of that and for your service and to the community and for, for all of that stuff, can I just thank you and we let you go and rest. So on behalf of all of those, thank you. Thank you, Joe.